What happens when a person with thoughts of taking their own life is encouraged to follow through with it? Michelle Carter was perceived as an instigator and accomplice in her boyfriend Conrad Roy's suicide. The case was more than complicated. Keep watching for the horrific true story behind Hulu's The Girl from Plainville. Warning, this video contains many references to suicide. If you or anyone you know is having suicidal thoughts, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK-8255. Conrad Roy's struggles with his mental health wasn't unfamiliar territory for the teenage couple. Mass Live reported that Roy had attempted to take his life in 2012 by overdosing on acetaminophen. This unsuccessful attempt occurred just after Roy had been released from a treatment program. Despite her son's history of mental health struggles, his mother Lynn didn't believe anything was out of the ordinary with Conrad, up to the day that he passed. In court during Carter's trial, she testified, I thought he was a little depressed. I thought he was doing great. I wish I would have picked up more signs that week, that day. She went on to describe how she and her son spent time walking on the beach the day of Roy's suicide. She recounted how Roy was joking about his future and was discussing his plans for a career. It seemed like he was just on the right track. It seemed like everything was like getting better. What she didn't know was that during this time, Roy was actively texting with Carter, planning out the logistics of his suicide for later that day. Videos that Roy made of himself were retrieved from his computer and played in court. The New York Times stated that Roy's own words in one video described himself as a minuscule little particle on the face of this earth. He also claimed that his life was a joke. Despite Roy's struggles with his mental health, he was an excellent student with an enviable level of athletic prowess. The Cut discusses how Roy graduated from high school a month before his death, posting an impressive 3.88 GPA. Though he later declined to attend, he had also been accepted into Fitchburg State University. While in high school, Roy played baseball and was on his school's rowing team. The grandson of a successful tugboat company owner in Massachusetts, Roy had hinted that he was going to follow in those footsteps. The year that Roy passed away, he completed his training and successfully obtained his captain's license. I, I do have a lot going for me. Like, I'm like a captain. On the surface, Roy had a bright future ahead of him, but with his anxiety and depression seeming to worsen, Roy had been pushed to the edge. And the person he shared his plans for suicide with was Michelle Carter. At one point, Roy sent a text to Carter suggesting that they had become the tragic Romeo and Juliet, but Carter shot down the suggestion. She had been encouraging Roy to get professional help for some time. Carter had a long history of mental health problems of her own. According to People Magazine, she had recently started taking the medication Celexa, used to treat anxiety and depression. In interviews with The Cut, Carter's former classmates describe a person who was similar to Conrad Roy in many ways. Carter was popular among her peers and was also athletic. Carter was at one time voted class clown and most likely to brighten your day. She was in this small community known as a really sweet, caring young woman. But her peers also spoke of Carter's fluctuating weight and how Carter had at one time referred to being admitted to McLean Hospital for mental health treatment. According to the 2019 HBO documentary, I Love You Now Die, a two-part series about the Roy suicide case, Carter had been on psychiatric medication since the age of 14. She had also struggled with eating disorders. While both Carter and Roy lived in Massachusetts, it was their family's vacationing in Florida that led to the two of them meeting. According to Esquire, Carter was in Naples visiting her grandparents in February 2012. Several doors down from where Carter was staying, Roy was being hosted by his great aunt. Carter and Roy met and began spending time together in Florida. Carter was one year Roy's junior, and the two of them stayed in close contact after they left Florida to return to the respective homes in Massachusetts. The relationship between Roy and Carter was mostly one that was held within the confines of digital communications. The Roy and his family only lived about an hour from Carter's Plainville home and may as well have been worlds apart. According to Newsweek, the relationship they had was mostly via text messages and phone calls. Esquire wrote that, according to Conrad's mother, Lynn, her son and Carter had seen each other in person no more than five times after their initial meeting in Naples before his passing in July 2014. When Lynn testified at Carter's trial, she was questioned about Roy's suicide attempt in 2012 when he swallowed an entire bottle of Tylenol. According to Esquire, she said Roy's plot was foiled when he phoned a friend immediately afterward, the call that saved his life. But circumstances were very different in July 2014. Instead, Carter was encouraging him to complete what he started. Though she had tried without success to get Roy to seek professional help in the months leading up to his eventual suicide, Carter had a change of heart in the weeks before his death. When Roy had mentioned taking his life in the past, Carter demanded that he get treatment. 
Why that tone changed is up for debate. What is known is that Roy and Carter exchanged hundreds of text messages the day of his death, with Carter continually pushing Roy to follow through with the job. Michelle Carter exploited my son's weaknesses and used him as a pawn. Where was her humanity? Boston 25 News released the text messages between Michelle Carter and Conrad Roy from the day of Roy's death, July 13, 2014. Early that morning, Carter sent a message to Roy asking why he hadn't done it yet. After Roy replied that he was too messed up, Carter berated him for pushing it off. Throughout the day, Roy received messages from Carter that contained disturbing content. In her messages, Carter seemed to be pressing Roy to end his life. She accused him of overthinking everything and kept assuring him that his suffering would be over when he followed through. At several points throughout the day, Carter appeared to be frustrated with Roy's hesitancy. She kept trying to impress on him that the only way to be free was to end his life. And when he kept making excuses for why he hadn't followed through, Carter responded with, I thought you wanted to do this. Early that evening, Roy pulled his pickup truck into a Kmart parking lot. The messages between Roy and Carter stopped at 6.28 p.m. the night of Roy's death, according to Boston 25 News. This left investigators with part of a picture painted by the message exchange between the two, and would later have it filled in by more statements from Carter's friend Samantha Boardman. Esquire reports that following the last text at 6.28, Roy called Carter in a call that lasted just over 42 minutes. At 7.12 p.m., Carter called Roy, with their phones connecting for over 45 minutes. Two days later, a text between Carter and Boardman reveal a message from Carter in which she claimed responsibility for his suicide, and that she could have done something to stop him but failed to act. According to Newsweek, Carter continued to lay the foundation of her guilt by texting that Roy's death was all her fault. In this series of texts, Carter revealed that at one point, Roy became afraid and got out of his truck as it was filling with fumes. According to Carter, she verbally ordered Roy to get back inside and finish what he started. The 317 pages of text between Michelle Carter and Conrad Roy that were laid out in court chronicled the entire timeline of the conversations the two teens had regarding Roy's eventual suicide. Brought into court on a charge of involuntary manslaughter, Carter faced up to 20 years in prison. Though she was only 17 at the time of Roy's death, Carter was charged as a youthful offender instead of as a juvenile. According to Rolling Stone, this would allow for the state to seek a stiffer sentence. Carter entered a plea of not guilty at the indictment. After being charged, Carter was held on a $250,000 bond. This was posted by her parents, and she was released into their custody. Carter was prohibited from any access to social media. The Boston Globe reported that she was also barred from sending text messages to anyone outside of immediate family members. Carter's defense team argued that she had First Amendment protection against her involuntary manslaughter charge. According to Mass Live, attorney Joseph Cataldo pointed out that the state of Massachusetts doesn't have any specific laws against assisting someone in their suicide. Cataldo referenced a recent ruling by the Minnesota Supreme Court in which they ruled that encouraging suicide was protected speech. The prosecutors insisted that the encouragement for following through with the suicide is exactly what prompted Conrad Roy to finish the job. While she could have phoned the police or requested medical treatment for Roy, she did nothing. This, according to prosecutors, made her culpable in Roy's death. In the end, Carter's defense team was unsuccessful in getting her charges dismissed and was equally unsuccessful in securing a not guilty verdict. According to CNN, in June 2017, Carter was found guilty in the juvenile court in which she was tried and awaited her sentencing hearing set for August of that year. Carter was sentenced to two and a half years in prison, with 15 months to be served and the remaining 15 months to be suspended. In addition, Carter was to be on probation for five years following her release. The fact that they are still of that young age offers a greater promise of rehabilitation. In cases where a convicted person is no longer deemed an immediate threat or a flight risk, a judge may allow that person to remain free on bond post-conviction until the case is reversed or upheld on appeal. When Carter's attorneys asked for this consideration, Judge Lawrence Moniz granted their request. With the post-conviction appeal process mired in red tape, it took until February 2019 before the High Court in the state of Massachusetts made their ruling. According to CNN, the Massachusetts Supreme Court voted to uphold the lower court's conviction. This prompted Moniz to have Carter surrender herself to Bristol County authorities immediately to begin her 15-month prison sentence. Her attorneys unsuccessfully tried to get an additional stay of her sentence while appealing to the United States Supreme Court. This additional stay was denied by Moniz, but for nearly five years after Conrad's death, Carter remained a free woman. Judge Moniz ordered Carter to serve her time at the Bristol County House of Corrections, but ruled that she only needed to serve a total of 15 months maximum behind prison walls. Moniz suspended the remainder of the sentence and ordered five years probation for Carter after she was released. 
People Magazine reports that law in Massachusetts will allow a convicted person to have up to 10 days taken off their sentence every month for good behavior. A spokesperson for the Bristol County House of Corrections told the outlet, Michelle Carter was considered a model inmate at the Bristol County House of Corrections. She took part in a lot of programs, was polite with the staff, had no problems with other inmates. I think by keeping busy the way she did, she was able to um, integrate very, very well in the Women's Center. With good behavior, this ended up reducing Carter's total time behind bars to a mere 11 months. News of her early release did not sit well with members of the Roy family. The New York Post was told by Roy's grandfather, Conrad Roy Sr., that he was, quote, disgusted with the whole system. The elder Roy continued expressing his frustration, adding, The sentence was too lenient. Fifteen months is nothing to a lifetime with my grandson. If you or anyone you know is having suicidal thoughts, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK-8255.